to uh, tonight's um, uh, talk, just very, very few words about our guest speaker. Some of you who come to our group meetings will no doubt have heard uh, Dave speak to us on uh, a couple, two or three subjects uh, in the past. Those of you who don't know him, when he does start talking, you might notice he talks funny. Uh, and that's because uh, he's, uh, he's a Londoner. Uh, he's made the journey all the way from Brentford to Bolton, although not tonight. He made that journey many years ago with multiple stops en route, but he's actually been with us uh, for nearly 40 years now. So he's very much an adopted uh, boatner. And uh, what is quite amazing is that uh, he's uh, fanatically interested in many aspects of Bolton's history, and he's extremely knowledgeable on so many different uh, topics, and we benefited from that in the past. And uh, I would venture to suggest that uh, he knows far more about Bolton and its history uh, than uh, the vast majority of people born here. Uh, I don't know anything in any detail about what Dave will talk to us tonight about, other than obviously the title, uh, but he comes to talk to us um, as our guest speaker at a time when we're all probably feeling very sorry for ourselves. Uh, much of the time. I have a suspicion that what we might see and hear tonight might put our current uh, trials and tribulations uh, into some sort of perspective. So although it is a virtual welcome, a very, we very warm West Orton welcome please uh, for Dave Burnham. Welcome Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very nice to see people clapping, uh, even though you've all muted yourselves. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, David, for the invitation and, and Phil and Val for your help. Um, <clears throat> and it's nice to see um, friends from elsewhere like Anne, Jane, Graham Holt. I'm a bit unnerved to see Ken Beavers, who knows more about this sort of thing than I will ever know in my entire life. Um, but I'll, <coughs> I'll do my best. We're talking about children of the workhouse in the first 50 years of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> and I'm talking about Bolton. There, there was a, a pre-1834 workhouse in West Horton, but uh, the 1834 Poor Law Act combined <coughs> a whole range of areas into one union um, which, which basically became Bolton Union and Farmworth Workhouse that the uh, Fishpool, the workhouse at Farmworth, took over. Okay, children of the workhouse, let's see if we can actually move the slides. There we are. Um, we're talking about children in public care, um, welfare services for children. Um, <clears throat> and, and these basically started in the 19th century with industrialization. Although if you look at the, the image there, the, the, the uh, palatial looking building in the bottom left hand corner uh, was to Thomas Coram's Foundling Hospital, which was founded in London in 1739. Before that, most help for waifs and strays and orphans was, um, was from the churches. Um, what happened with urbanization, industrialization as towns got bigger and it saw a huge increase in the amount of squalor, but also in the amount of charitable work. Um, there were all sorts of um, organisations set up to deal with and respond to the most obvious problems. So there were early societies for people who were deaf or blind or Pregnant women, fallen women means pregnant women. Uh, the, the, the problems in society that were obvious. But there was a real fad for amongst wealthy people for visiting the poor and visiting the sick. Uh, and this cartoon is from Punch of a, a lovely lady dressed up in her furs, just about to go out to the theater 
and she's at the bedside of a sick old lady, whether the sick old lady wants her to be there or not. Lots and lots of this sort of activity, undirected and possibly unwanted. What was wanted by poor people, of course, um, if, they were, <coughs> if they were hungry and poor and ill, was food. And this is a, an affecting picture from Manchester, queuing for soup, 1900. Um, and really that reflected the, the, the tenor of the times. If you, were, if you were thrown out of work or you're on short time, you probably were a couple of weeks away at the most from, from poverty. And, and of course, winter threw thousands of people out of work. At the same time, children were underfed and there was lots of stunted growth rickets and no money for doctors. If you wanted a doctor, you had to pay for it yourselves, of course. And you had to, and lots of people who were careful about this, working people, they uh, contributed to Providence societies and paid their tuppence a week. So when they got ill, they could call a doctor. Um, can I? Sorry. I'm finding this very strange with there being no noise, um, and no shuffling of feet. And uh, so I, I'm going to ask people to unmute themselves. And so I can hear people. OK. Does that make sense? It just feels yep. that I'm talking yep. to myself. All right. Fine. <laughs> I, I, I've, un I've unmuted myself. All I can right. just see that beautiful picture of those lovely boys. Mm. OK. I, 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 when, I, when I say unmute yourself, ask questions, but not too many. Okay. <laughs> you all know how to unmute. Yes, yeah. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. If people, if I hear, if recognise a voice too often, I shall tell them to mute themselves again. <laughs> um, right. This is a wonderful photograph. There are 62 boys here, and there are three workers at the back: two women and a and a young yeah. man. This is a a home, a, a children's home in Blackburn. I'm not sure where it is. I'm not sure if it's Crowthorn, the, the huge home just north of, of Edgeworth. And this is one of the really big uh, uh, movements in the 19th century. Um, individuals like Dr. Bernardo, Thomas Stevenson, the Methodist, um, setting up National Children's Homes, and Edward Ru Rudolph, who set up the Waifs and Strays Society, all four um, children, orphan children, abandoned children, um, and you can see, if you look carefully, they all have the same haircut. Their hair has all been shaved. That's about preventing knits. They all have similar clothes, which seem to be of reasonable quality. Yeah. And they all have good sets of clogs. So you're talking about, I mean, obviously this is a formal photograph, but these clothes look, these children look reasonably well looked after. The other note at the bottom there is penitentiaries for fallen girls. Um, this was a movement that started in the 1850s. Set off, set off by, started by um, Anglican nuns. Penitentiaries were very, were for, as you say, it says fallen women. Um, so that's either uh, uh, unmarried girls who were pregnant and they took the, 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 ch the girls in and, the, and they had their babies and then the babies were adopted and so on and so forth. But they were also for women that the middle class affluent women oh, thought were, in, were in some danger yes. of, of falling. Yeah, I know. So that's what we've got with the... Um, Voluntary sector. Ah, right. Oh, who that's this? good. Somebody tells me who. Somebody tell me who this is. If you know, Holly Anna. <laughs> Anne of Green Gables. This is Anne of Green Gables. That's right. <laughs> this is from a, 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 a TV series, and she's got more than one leg, I think. Um, <laughs> this is another, this is another example of the things that they were trying to do. Um, Child immigration started in the, in fact, started in the 1850s, became a big thing in the 1870s. And the aim was to clear the streets of urban Britain of, of, of strays and, and orphans, and also to populate the colonies with British stock. Uh, 
In the 19th century, it was mostly Canada, and after the Great War, Australia mm -hmm. took the brunt. And you may recall the scandal um, which M Margaret Humphreys uh, uh, un unveiled about 20 mm -hmm. years ago, where she rediscovered the number of children who were sent against their will mm -hmm. and against their, their parents' will to Australia um, between 19, the 1950s and 1970. Um, there was always a problem with this because although some of these organisations who uh, managed child migration were, re were, uh, uh, were decent, some just basically sent the children out to be servants. Um, but thousands and tens and thousands of children um, were, were sent to these uh, Canada and then Australia. Right, so that, that's the voluntary sector. Um, I've mentioned the workhouse already. This is and this is Fishpool Workhouse uh, in in Farmworth, which is next to the hospital. Was part of the hospital. And the picture at the bottom there, um, you can still see parts of the hospital still um, have some yeah. of these buildings left. Yeah. Um, um, and this was part of the poor law. The poor law was paid from out the rates, and there were forty guardians voted for regularly. Uh, guardians, when they were men, until about 1895, um, they saw their principal job as to save the rates, i.e. to spend as little on um, uh, paupers as possible. Um, Paul offered help if you were destitute. Um, and although from 1834, the idea was if you, were, if you presented yourself to the poor law um, and you were assessed as being destitute, you were only offered the house, i.e. the workhouse. Um, but that became so expensive that, that uh, the relieving officers started offering food and then money. Um, and if you, the ninth figure for 1912, which I happen to know in Bolton, was that there were a thousand people in the workhouse and 2000 people receiving benefit called out relief. And the system was that a relieving officer, and I think in 1912, there were about nine of them, um, would assess people's needs, they'd present a case, cases to the guardians who met every week, and then your fate would be decided. Having said that, for older people from 1900, um, the relieving officer actually used to go to their house and pay them money themselves. So you're talking about a significantly better service um, than some older people get today. Right. Paul or also gave smallpox vaccinations, was a medical service, and WG Grace's name there is because he was a poor law doctor, a growing hospital service, and registrar of births and deaths. By 1912, um, the workhouse mostly was old people, lunatics, mental defectives, and I use those terms advisedly because they were the technical terms used at the time. Uh, and lone lawn women and abandoned children. Now, lone lawn women means women abandoned by their husbands. Um, so that was the population mostly of the workhouse. And although um, the image that we have is you go into the workhouse, you're never seen again. People were leaving and going back and leaving and going back to the workhouse all the time. Um, final point there in that list is casual, destitute men, casuals which was at King Street in Bolton. If you wanted a bed for the night um, in the casual ward in King Street, you could only turn up at four o'clock. You had to do some work, you got fed, uh, you got a bed, and then you had to do some work before you were let out at 10 o'clock. So, um, and in some places they only allowed you one night in each casual ward, which led to tramping, certainly in the summer, men tramping between workhouses so that they didn't have to stay in the same place at the same time. Right, if you want to ask any questions about that, ask away. Mm. Can I ask um, how it was that some children were in a workhouse, perhaps in the early 19th, in the early 20th century, and some were in homes? What was the deciding factor to, to put some in orphanages, but some in a workhouse? We're coming on to that. Okay, right, thanks. <laughs> Okay, I'll move on. Anybody else? I'll move on. Um, 
<clears throat> these glorious photographs uh, of uh, Sergeant Blake and Mr. Harper, these were the men who ran the NSPCC in Bolton. As you can see, Sergeant Blake wore a uniform, um, as in fact NSPCC officers did until 1970. All NSPCC officers until that time were men, and they were more or less all ex-policemen and ex-soldiers, um, because that's the sort of people that they thought um, the parents would look up to. Uh, 1910, an NSPCC inspector called Walter Payne wrote a, a, a basically an autobiography. And he talked about um, the sort of children he was dealing with, the sort of families, children of drunk, drunken parents, disabled children parents could no longer cope with, stepchildren who could not be accepted by the step parent, and tramps children. Sometimes women and men would tramp around to various places <coughs> and then they'd leave their children if it got too much of them. What you need to have uh, be aware of, of course, is that uh, people died young in childbirth, of infectious diseases and industrial accidents. So there were many step families and many genuine orphans. But there were also children who'd been abandoned or wandered the streets, children of people so wretched they were in real danger. Uh, uh, infants were almost universally removed from unmarried mothers if they came into any sort of systematic system. The greatest threat at the time to children was thought to be drink, their parents drinking. Um, that was absolutely the number one fear. Right, Marion's question. Um. From about 18... 70s, 1870s, 1880s, children under the control of the poor law, i.e. in care, began to be cared for outside the workhouse because it was thought that children would benefit from a more family-like atmosphere. So cottage homes and scattered homes were created. Now scattered homes were basically ordinary houses. Cottage homes tended to be purpose-built and quite large, um, but they weren't the workhouse. There was also an attempt to uh, have children adopted on. Uh, adoption was an entirely informal arrangement at the time. Uh, the, the first adoption act, adoption act was 1926 when there had to be safeguards and inspections and so on and so forth, um, but adoption was entirely informal. The The Real innovation was boarding out. Um, this was children boarded out with ordinary families and paid to look after those children who were boarded out. It was always, or initially, it was very, very controversial because there certainly were cases of, of couples who sought boarded out children just to use them as servants. Um, so the, the boarding out arrangements were inspected. To answer Marion's question directly, I don't think, apart from for very short-term arrangements, by 1900-1910, any children lived for long, uh, on a, on a longer-term basis in the workhouse. They were either cottage homes, scattered homes, boarded out, um, uh, or they were looked after in the voluntary, voluntary homes by uh, people like Bernardo's that we saw earlier on. Oh my good grief, we don't look at this woman. Do you dare, do you dare to look at Amelia Dyer? <laughs> yes, you yes. Do. One of the other informal yeah. things that happened was baby farming. Women advertised carefully um, to foster children. Um, these were private arrangements. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the adverts were both ways. Um, women who'd had a baby that they didn't want, couldn't keep, advertised, and um, women and married couples who wanted to foster advertised as well. It was all very subtle. And obviously it was about managing unwanted children, mostly by um, uh, uh, unmarried women who had, who had children. But what it led to was baby farming, which was women looking after children in a very slapdash way um, and looking after an increasing number of children. The really shocking thing is 
that the foster mother would name a price, the mother would hand the baby over, not expecting ever to see that child again. And of course, most of the, the, the foster mothers were in effect middle women uh, and they would adopt on uh, children. Now, some of them like Amelia Dyer cut out the middleman and killed the children. Um, there were several, um, there were several examples of, of women being found out and prosecuted and hanged for this um, in the last 20 years of the 19th century. Um, and in fact, Amelia Dyer, there's a real, although she was killing babies in Reading, the connection with Bolton is that she was hanged by James Billington, the Bolton hangman. Um, and if you want to read about baby farming, um, Emma Hornby, who is from Breitmet, who's, who, who writes family sagas like Catherine Cookson and Ruth Hamilton, um, the one of her books called A Mother's Dilemma is about basically about baby farming. And of course, Somerset Maugham wrote Of Human Bondage, and there was a section about baby farming in that as well. It's a really shocking thought, which is, is forgotten here. now. Hello, what was that? Was that a question? Yes, can oh. you read the name of this, uh, of this author, please? The name of the... Of the woman that wrote this book, please. Sorry, I can't hear. It's the author who wrote the book. The Which author? book? Oh, um, Emma Hornby okay. and Somerset Maugham. Mm. Yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> so if we move on, um, the, the, the list there is, the, is, is by, night, by the beginning of the First World War, um, th th this is the list of ex responsibilities that the Poor Law Union had. And you can see it's very, very broad, a whole range of activities. Um, which most of which we've mentioned already. There are there are three that we've three or four we've not mentioned. Five we've not mentioned. <laughs> Affiliation orders. That is when a father um, has a, a man has fathered a child on a woman, um, and it was the poor law's responsibility to chase the man down and get money off him through the court. From 1906, there were relieving officers for lunatics. Again, a technical term. Um, they work particularly with people who were having uh, breakdowns and florid, um, florid episodes. From 1913, the Mental Deficiency Act, the uh, uh, poor law became an agent for the visiting of people within their own homes. And infant life protection visits, um, the response to the, 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 the baby farming scandals um, <clears throat> was the last one was the 1897 Infant Life Protection Act, I think, which required each union to employ an infant life protection visitor, <laughs> take responsibility for making sure that private fostering arrangements were all above board. And finally, at the bottom there, the poor law funded in part a whole range of voluntary organisations, mental welfare committees, the NSPCC, lots and lots of district nursing associations in Bolton, the Home for Inebriate Women, Discharge Prisons Aid Society and so on and so forth. The delightfully named Cripples Parlour, um, which wasn't so much a technical term, but that's what that's that's the, the hideous phrase that people used. Now, um, <clears throat> there are there are um, three or four photographs of people in this slides from now on. They are not the real people, but just give an impression. Mm. Um, this young woman is, is, represents Alice Kersley, who from 1912 became Bolton's lazy lady, not lazy at all, lady visitor. Um, <clears throat> the um, local government board, which was basically the Department of Health, said that in, from 1910, they said that there must be a woman employed to work with children. And all, before that, all the relieving officers were men. Now, <coughs> Bolton uh, um, apply, um, advertised for a lady visitor um, whose job was to manage the needs of 350 children in all, 
infant life protection, aftercare, children looked after by the poor law union, out relief cases, tramps, children, bastardy orders. Now she wasn't to do that all on her own. She had about 20 volunteers, um, but it's still a huge responsibility that she had to manage. <clears throat> in the um, Central Library in Bolton, there are, uh, by, by strange chance, there's huge personnel files of people who worked in the um, poor law union, but there are the 76 application forms of all the women who applied for her job. Um, Alice Kersley got the job and she was the daughter of James Kersley, a butcher, who had also been a conservative councillor and an alderman. Well, surprise, surprise that she got it. What you have to realise is that nepotism was really part of the accepted way that things happened back in 1912. So anyway, Alice got this job and she started work. Um, oh, this is, this is Alice Kersley. She was doing um, all this work for the 350 children, but because she was a woman, she was only paid two thirds of the amount of the male mm. relieving officers. Typical. Typical. <laughs> Typical. Typical. What's happening now with everywhere? Now, can you read that while I've put on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, this is Alice's, yeah. part of Alice's application for a pay rise. Because there were no unions then for these sorts of workers, or perhaps there were, but each worker had to negotiate their own pay rise. Um, and after two years work, Alice decided it was time that she <clears throat> wrote to the um, Henry Isherwood Cooper, who was the secretary of the Poor Law Union, asking for an increase. So she spent the time on bank holiday Monday um, writing the application. Can you think of any reason why, and it was unsuccessful, can you think of any reason why this application was unsuccessful? Anybody? She was a woman. It was the start of the war at the same time. It was time. the 5th of August, 1914. Oh, yeah. Well, 14, yeah. And people had bigger fish to fry. She yeah. did get an, an increase, uh, but that was only in 1917. Mm. Oh, look at that. So, mm. at the time during the Great War, children in public care were adopted on, um, put out for apprenticeship. If, if you were in public care as a child, um, you went to school till you were 13, and then you were either as a girl, you were put out to domestic service, or as a boy, you were put well, out. Well, no, I'm not really talking training. about Bolton. All right. What's that? Didn't hear that. Um, you were put out for, boys were put out for apprenticeships, um, either in factories or in shops. Girls were put out to domestic service. And although rich people took on these servants, the records show that, that many people taking on these apprentices and uh, domestic workers were shopkeepers, and some were miners, mill operatives, clerks, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't just um, big companies that took these um, children on. All right, I will read this because it's quite complicated. Um, the NSPCC, until 1970, were the people who dealt with what we now call child abuse. And it was the Public Assistance Committee from 1930 that took children into public care. But the relieving officers of the, the, the poor law in the 19, in the great, during the Great War and in the 1920s, they dealt with a whole range of abuses of children. But they also had particular sets of expectations about the way that mothers in particular should behave. So, Mrs. Smith, from 1924, her husband died in 1922, and she had two daughters. Um, they lived off out relief for two years as a family. Then she went to prison for three months, during which time the girls were taken into the cottage homes. Mum did not reclaim them afterwards, but visited regularly, now, possibly because she didn't want to take responsibility for paying for, for funding them, feeding them. She married a coloured man who left her when he found out she had children. 
the relieving officer reported she was living an immoral life with coloured people mm -hmm. and proposed the girls be taken formally into public care, lest the mother reclaim them when they became old enough to work and to live off them. Mm -hmm. So that gives a flavour of the sorts of things that happened and the sorts of suspicions that relieving officers had about the attitudes of some parents to some children. Mm. Right, let me stop there. Any, any questions? Any more questions, thoughts, tomatoes? Can I ask please about... Just very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Could I ask... Can, can I ask a question? Is that Marta asking a question? No, no it's not. Carlton. Oh, okay, yeah, go on. Um, in, uh, in on Blackburn Road in Bolton, there was a building called the Waterloo Building. Was that a workhouse? Blackburn Road. Yeah, was that a workhouse? No, the only workhouse in, there were the only workhouse in Bolton was Fishpool at the where the hospital is now, and there was a casual ward at King Street, which has been pulled down for years. Right. Where, where, how far up Blackburn Road is this? Well, it's near the, near the, the where Halliwell Road starts. No, there was no workhouse there. There was no workhouse right. there. Right. Okay. okay. Could I ask about Hollins Cottage Homes? Yes. The side of Fishpool. Was that to yeah. do with uh, this, uh, these arrangements? Yes, Hollins Cottage Homes were the cottage homes for the um, for the Fishpool Workhouse. Um, and if there were any children or infants who had no parents at all, that's where they were looked after. Um, generally, the, the, it was it was fairly uh, oh, it was it was quite uncaring to begin with, and the attendants who dealt with everybody else in the workhouse were the attendants who looked after the children. But around 1901, one of the, um, one of the poor law guardians called Mary Haslam, who was a real philanthropist, a really powerful and progressive character. Um, she said, let's have a married couple to look after or married couples to look after these children, i.e. trying to recreate the idea of a family um in the cottage homes um and so the cottage homes went on now the cottage homes they were still operating in the 1980s uh, on a completely different basis just like a, a a children's home and they must have been pulled down 15 20 years ago yeah. but they were part of the poor law they were part of the poor law service okay, thank you Let me carry. Any, anything else one more question please uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, children who were adopted, who didn't go into cottage homes or the scattered homes, and children who were boarded out. Would the people who adopted or boarded them get any payments from the poor law? The, the, people, the people who boarded, <coughs> who looked after children in their own homes, yeah. they would be paid a weekly um, uh, stipend fee uh, um, as as still happens today I, I really don't know how much that would have been um, <clears throat> but there were significant numbers of children who were boarded out as far as adop adoption is concerned I'm I don't think that formally money changed hands which isn't to say that money didn't change hands but certainly parent, uh, uh, couples and families who accepted children as, as board, uh, to, in boarding out, they will be paid a, a, a weekly wage. Okay? Thank you very much. Right, this is Wood Street in Bolton. Um, and in the 1920s, this is where Alice Kersley worked in the early 1920s. Um, <clears throat> she was 39 when she was taken on in 1912. She worked all through the war, got her pay rise, <coughs> and then she married in 1919. 
um, and she asked the guardians whether she could carry on work and they said yes and then six months later they sacked her now it seems to me looking at the records that Henry Isherwood Cooper the secretary was really quite uh, suspicious of her, um, her working practices although he didn't have enough to sack her but there were notes criticizing her for being late criticizing her for not doing what she should be doing and there were um, there were responses so one day when she was late and arrived at 9 45 in the morning she responded by saying well i was on the tram talking to one of the poor law guardians i.e one of cooper's bosses so that skewered him for that anyway um the guardians just sacked her completely out of hand um and she was no fool she went to the female guardian um, uh, sorry, the, the, sorry, the implication of why she was sacked was that it was to do with returning to uh, normal after the Great War. And lots of women who'd been teachers, secretaries, mm -hmm. tram conductors, they were got rid of to provide work for the men returning from the front. The problem with doing this with Alice Kersley was her job title was Lady Visitor. <laughs> so it was never going to be a job for a man anyway. <laughs> anyway, she got in touch with Mary Haslam and three or four of the other <coughs> uh, very senior and progressive female guardians. They took it to the newspaper and Alice Kersley was reinstated two days later. <laughs> then, unfortunately, uh, she found a lump in her breast, which was a tumour. Um, uh, the operation to remove it was successful. But she then resigned um, uh, about a year later. It was all getting a bit too much for her. Um, she lived until the early 1950s, lived right at the top of Halliwell Road. Um, and there was a happy-ish ending because she married when she was something like 50 years of age um, and seemed to have lived a happy life after that. Now, when she left, they employed a woman called Annie Higginson to take her place, who had been an insurance sick visitor. This is the National Insurance Scheme. She was from Blackburn. She had no formal training and uh, she did Alice Kersley's job. A couple of years later, they reviewed the needs of child welfare visiting and they appointed a second woman to be Annie Higginson's boss this was Ada Wainer, who was from Nottingham. Her father was a builder. She had been a housekeeper. She went, um, trained as a midwife. She had mid midwifery training. She trained in sisterhood social work, which is basically working with um, fallen women, to use that phrase. She worked at a crash in Hammersmith. She looked after a vicar's three children um, <clears throat> in Moss Side in Manchester and she was a woman visitor in Oldham, which was the same job as Annie Higginson. To cut this story short, Annie Higginson could be described as a fly-by-night. Ada Wainer can be described as a new broom. They did not get on. <laughs> so after about a year, Ada Wainer produced this dossier of everything that Annie Higginson was doing wrong, i.e. writing reports of visits she hadn't actually made, <laughs> mixing up the names of different families and different children, and not doing as many visits as she should. Annie Higginson replied, having shouted at um, Ada Wainer, uh, replied, um, justifying all of her actions. So this skewered um, Henry Isherwood Cooper, who went to the Guardians and a special subcommittee was set up um, and the Guardians failed to make a decision. They were both admonished and Henry Isherwood Cooper decided what he would do to manage the situation was to get them two offices. One sat in one room, the other sat in the other. <laughs> 
but they could not afford two typewriters, which <laughs> were written on. So there was more fighting about the typewriter. <clears throat> and in the end, it was all resolved in about four hours. Henry Isherwood, uh, Henry Isherwood Cooper made Annie Higginson an offer she couldn't refuse, i.e. I will sack you or I will give you a wonderful reference if you resign. She resigned. Mm. And in the archive in Bolton Central Library, there is a copy of the reference that was then written to the insurance company she applied for a job for, and it is wonderful. <laughs> so that's how to manage your staff. There you go. <laughs> so by the 1930s, <clears throat> Uh, oh, the 1930, the Guardians were abolished and the Council Public Assistance Committee became responsible for all welfare, including child welfare. Um, <clears throat> and in 1937, the relieving officers of children's visitors moved here to Le Mans Crescent. And the 1933 Children and Young Persons Act and school board men, i.e. Uh, WAG men, um, they became school and welfare officers and became responsible for removing children into public care. And it was interesting because what happened was the women, the female children's visitors carried on visiting and supporting children. And it was the men, the old wag men, the old school inspectors, um, school board men who moved to do the, um, the tough action of actually removing children into public care. So here we've got late 1930s. <clears throat> Interwar years saw no real change in the way children were, were treated. <coughs> Bolton had about 250 children in public care, a lot of genuine orphans, cottage homes, boarded out with families, voluntary children's homes, and there were these things called industrial schools, and, and it was mostly uh, boys who might have done a bit of offending um, who went to industrial schools. There was one at Lostock or children were adopted. And uh, whatever the circumstances, there was a lot of movement back between the various forms of care and people going, uh, and children going back to their own, um, their own families. Okay, <clears throat> you'll be relieved to know we're coming towards the end. Um, the <clears throat> there was a great change caused by the Second World War. Um, uh, and that was mostly because of the vast exercise, which was children's evacuation. Um, none of the other combatants did anything like Britain did. I mean, there was some evacuation in Germany and France, <coughs> but um, Britain evacuated. I mean, in the first week of September 1939, two million children were evacuated. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the evacuation, it was not just a static thing because children went back to their own homes. If there was another bomb scare, they'd go back to being, um, to being looked after in the country and so on and so forth. And there were lots and lots of children who were very difficult to place. There was shock in the country at the dirt and grime and bad behavior of some of the children from big cities, or oh, that's what, <clears throat> uh, uh, local country people said anyway. But there were also places, um, if children could not be placed um, in people's homes, they were placed in hostels. And there were, in effect, in effect the whole of the evacuation process um, was a laboratory for childcare. The woman, the picture of the woman on the right, um, that, that, her name is, is Susan Isaacs, oh, born, yeah. born Susan Fairhurst in Bradshaw in Bolton in 1885. Um, she was something else. She was really powerful character. Her father took her out of school when she was 14. So she left home to live with her sister and then went to become a nanny in Morocco in 1900. Mm -hmm. um, went to Manchester University um became a psychotherapist and also she ran the, uh, an experimental school in york called the maltings and she had a very very considerable inf influence on <coughs> attitudes to childhood play 
and the notion of attachment, i.e. that children thrive if they are attached properly to their parental figures. And this was confirmed by people like uh, um, Donald Winnicott, that's the, the man in the bottom left-hand corner, John Bowlby, um, that's the man in the striped shirt, and, and Melanie Klein, that's the woman next to Susan Isaacs. Mm. All of this work and all of this writing was going on during the Second World War. And at the end of the Second World War, there was a considerable attempt, <coughs> excuse me, to return to something better, not just to return to normal. Um, part of it was to do with making sure men coming out of the forces had jobs. So there was special training for teachers. There was special training for mental health workers. There was special training um, for children's workers. Um, and attitudes very, very um, clearly began to change. In Bolton, uh, Ada Wainer retired in 1945 and Mavis Smith, C. Ross, and I don't know what C. Ross's first name was, and Miss Striffler were the three child welfare visitors. C. Ross went on a brief mental health course in London in 1946 and convinced, came back convinced about the importance of keeping siblings together, which hadn't been considered beforehand, and the, and the importance of the role of foster fathers. Um, Mavis Smith had a really awful experience um, and she moved a 14 year old girl from the cottage homes to a foster placement on Thicketford Road. Um, what happened with that was, is that the, 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 her foster parents, her boarding out parents, expected her to call their mum and dad from the beginning um, and the woman's mother, i.e. the sort of the, the, the replacement granny, expected her to call her granny but also to be a skivvy. So Mavis Smith removed that girl from that situation which was perfectly fine physically in the amount of food and so on and so forth but emotionally it was wrong. The house on the left um, which is in fact opposite the um, Trinity Church. Um, it was a Catholic home for girls. And uh, Mavis Smith placed two girls there. But when she visited, she was livid that there was never any hot water, um, that the clothes given for her to, for the children to wear were the skimpiest, and there weren't enough blankets. She, she actually took the two girls home herself. Um, she was a bit stymied, but because, because she couldn't remove them into care because they were already in care. Um, so she had to take them home and she looked after them for 10 days before different arrangements were made for them. So you're talking about an emergence of a different set of attitudes towards children, keeping siblings together, um, and a real attempt to try to recreate family life for children in care. But the NSPCC still carried on. Um, and this grainy picture from the Bolton Evening News in 1950 is of Marmaduke Fraser, who was the long-term NSPCC officer in Bolton. Um, he, he'd been in the army, then he was in the police, then he spent 20 years in the, um, uh, in the NSPCC. And I've been told by the, the daughter of a detective who used to spend some time with Marmaduke in Farmworth. And he said, we'd go into the pubs and they'd empty of all the women in there who'd run out the back, who'd left their children at home on their own. <laughs> because, uh, and this is the point of having a uniform, isn't it? Um, so he was a bit of a star was, uh, was Marmaduke. Okay, it's coming up to half past eight. I'll finish on the story of Dennis O'Neill. Does anybody remember the story of Dennis O'Neill? No. 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 Uh, th this is um, the, the first and the most classic um, child abuse scandal, really. Um, <clears throat> Dennis was the oldest, then there was Terry, and then Freddie. So Dennis, in the picture here, Dennis is in the middle. Terry's on the left and Freddie is the little boy on the right. Um, they were removed from their parents in Newport 
these three boys. Um, uh, there were girls as well. I mean, it was drunken parents. And the girls were placed with relatives. The boys were placed um, <clears throat> in a foster home. In fact, they, they went, they had two or three, uh, two or three foster homes. One was with um, an old lady in a very, very big mansion, which they thought was wonderful. Um, but the, the boarding out officers thought that the boys should be in a Catholic family because they were Catholics. So they kept looking for something better. And in 1944, summer of 1944, they decided to make an arrangement with a family in Shrewsbury. Um, <clears throat> and the boarding out officer received a letter from the woman that they were gonna take her to, take the boys to, the day before he was due to go saying, um, I've had two, two children placed by Shrewsbury Council, I can't take your boys, but he took them anyway. And <clears throat> with a bit, of, a bit of pressure, she took Freddie, O'Neill, but she said there's a farm up the way with a bank farm. They've had children in the past. So Dennis and Terry were taken up to bank farm to Mr. and Mrs. Goff. And Mr. and Mrs. Goff already had two girls from yes. Shrewsbury County Council, um, but the boys stayed there. Mr. and Mrs. Goff kept from the boarding out officer the fact that she already had two girls staying there. And in fact, the following week they were taken away. Freddie and Dennis were used as slaves, really. And Dennis died of exposure because they slept in an unheated, uh, bar, uh, unheated attic. And Dennis was beaten every, every night by Mr. Goff. Um, Dennis died on the 9th of, 9th of January, 1945. Um, and because there was difficulty with getting um, court places. And because Newport Council and Shrewsbury Council had an argument about whose responsibility all this was, every two weeks there was an, a twist and turn which was in the press to the extent that when the Goffs were tried for manslaughter, it was a huge scandal. And there was a, um, a, a committee formed to inquire into what happened, the Moncton Committee, which uh, I mean, you consider the, the, the amount of time these things take, the, these inquiries take these days. He reported in 28 days. Um, and again, there was a big press thing. And this directly influenced um, the Children Act of 1948, uh, the, the scandal of Dennis O'Neill. It, 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 there is um, there's a book by Terry uh, who had a terrible life. Freddie was fine. Fred, I think Freddie became a doctor. But Terry wrote this yeah. book, which is an appalling, um, appalling story of, of the, uh, the, the horror that these boys suffered. Um, now I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I, I know it, it ends on a sort of a frayed and emotional note, but I do notice it's 32 minutes past eight. You're probably bored rigid with me going on, um, but we will we'll now have some proper questions. Okay. Dave, just going back to the earlier point about um, Adoption, adoptions and things in the 1800s. Quite often on census returns, you can find children that have disappeared from one branch of the family and popped up with an auntie or an, an uncle, aren't they? Mm. Is it likely that that would have been a formal arrangement then and they'd have got some income from it? Would there be a paper trail even? I think it was, if, if there was any money in the family, I would imagine it may have been formal in the sense that there may have been um, lawyers involved in, mm. in, in drawing up arrangements for who's responsible. For ordinary people, I, I suspect that there is no paper trail. So I think it's just for the, aff I, don't, I don't know Jane, but I, I, I suspect it's just for the affluent really, mm. <clears throat> that there'll be some sort of paper trail. But of course, 
you know, families have always looked at, if there's been a difficulty, families have looked after the young children and perhaps the young mm. children haven't gone back and so on and so forth. Yeah. A lot of that being completely informed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my, own, my own mother was, or, was orphaned and um, she was then brought up by her aunt, but had actually been in an orphanage for a few years with Spurgeons down in London. And um, when she was fostered to her aunt, they carried on paying like out relief to my aunt to look mm. after her, mm. um, which was another, yes, that was in the 1930s. So that obviously before benefits and so on for that kind of thing. Mm. So, so, so I've only, it's Anne, isn't it? I've only just realised who was talking. It is, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're, yeah. the, it's so not... one of the authorities actually paid it out, paid out relief to the aunt, your aunt, the, the yeah. her aunt. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. That's yeah. right, because they, they weren't terribly well off. And if my aunt had adopted my mother, she would have had, sounds awful this, it sounds very sort of mercenary, but if she'd adopted her, she would have had to have obviously funded, you know, paid, found the money for her and they, they didn't have much money. So that, that was a way round of yeah, my yeah. mum not being in care, but, but being in a home and so, but also getting some, you know, subsidence, you know, subsidy until she could go to work. So, which was an arrangement that obviously worked well, but also my mother was brought up in Cardiff and yet the home was in London and that's where, I think the money came from there, unless the local authority got involved. But I don't know if local authorities did pay for out relief. I, I don't know how yeah, it worked in those days. The local authority, but it links in with what, what, what you were saying, really. The local authority, out relief was paid by the local authority in the 30s. So it would have been the local authority. Mm. So maybe it came from, yeah. So it might came from the local authority where my mother was brought up rather than from the from the uh, orphanage. But anyway, that was the arrangement. So yeah, mm. very different times. Mm. Very different. Can I just make a comment? Um, my name is Graham Holt and I'm from the Bolton Family History Society. The History Centre in the Central Library has masses of Bolton Workhouse records, yeah. including a servant's register, which indicates what happened to all the children that were taken out of the Bolton Workhouse. Some of the children were as young as seven. Yeah. Some children were taken out more than once and then returned and taken out again. Yeah. And the last child to, uh, to be entered in the um, servants register, I think it was in 1926. So it's, the people were still being taken out of the workhouse as servants in 26. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen, I've looked at those records, Graham. Um, the, <clears throat> they, it, it is called a servant's register. Some of them were treated as servants. Others were, were <coughs> treated as members of the family. But the, the, as you say, the shocking thing was that there were, it was almost as if, it wasn't as if, uh, I mean, we, we would use the phrase that the adoption broke down. Um, today but there were several of the children who were obviously tried and weren't good enough so they were you know they'd, they'd be back after about two months then it'd be shipped off to somebody else yep. very strange yes there's one case in the late 19th century of a man coming from Rochdale to pick up a seven-year-old boy and I thought that was strange until I actually clocked that the man was a chimney sweep. <laughs> why he didn't go to Oldham Workhouse or Rochdale or Berry Workhouse, why he came all the way from Rochdale to Bolton, I don't know. There are instances of children going as far as Huddersfield and Nantwich from the Bolton Workhouse. Perhaps Bolton was a bit loose <laughs> compared to perhaps it wasn't they weren't as mm. respectful and they were more respectful in other places than in, in Bolton I don't know I've not I've not come across that I think that is probably true mm. Mm. David yes hello can you hear me yes David can you hear me um yes. you you said um that the board of guardians um was disbanded in 1930 yeah uh, how does that link with the actual the, the 
the chronology of the workhouse. Was there a finite date when Bolton workhouse ceased, or was it a slow metamorphosis with into the hospital? No, the <clears throat> the poor law stayed, but who the the authority that was responsible for the poor law changed in 1930. <clears throat> Technically, the poor law guardians were separate from the council. What happened in 1930 was that the poor law was incorporated into the council. Um, the poor law stayed, the workhouse stayed. Uh, the workhouse was the workhouse until whenever, whenever the NHS started, June the 5th, 1947. Um, but what, one of the thing, interesting things about that was that the, the local authorities weren't actually given that much money to make alternative arrangements. So there were many local authorities who were still using the workhouse as old people's accommodation into the 1960s. Yeah. Now this didn't happen in Bolton because um, unlike the chimney sweep scandal that Graham's talked about, um, the council in Bolton uh, almost jumped the gun with uh, creating separate old people's homes in the workhouse, one of them being Watermillock, on um, the which is now Toby Carvery. I mean, that yeah, was yeah. old people's home for a long time. And that started operating before the workhouse was, was abolished. Um, but again, in the 1960s, it was a big scandal. There was still old people being cared for in the workhouse, um, you know, 15, 20 years after um, the poor law had been abolished. And of course, <coughs> the, 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 in the 1950s, the um, criteria really for going into a residential home for older people was destitution still, mm. rather than disability, which is what it is now. Um, and it took a long time for that for that shift to um, to be completed. Oh. So in my lifetime, Bolton Workhouse was still in operation. Mm. You don't look that old, David. Yeah, well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but no, yeah. Bolton Workhouse, obviously, that the the fishpool. Um, it, it, it's interesting because when it was built. God, I forget, 1850, 1860, um, it was the workhouse. And slowly, yeah. slowly, slowly, hospital bits were added onto it. And of course, it became a hospital um, setting site. Um, and the workhouse fishbowl building was used for offices and physio and all sorts of things. Mm. Um, and I think it's a terrible shame that it was pulled down because that was a cracking building. It was an amazing building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just a car park. <laughs> well, are we all, uh, everybody mm -hmm. done with questions? Um, um, uh, you, yeah. Can I just, uh, yeah, no, no, no. can I just ask a question? Or yeah. Ra rather make a statement. Uh, my father was born in 1906. And he always had this morbid fear of actually ending up in the workhouse. You know, I think the workhouse continued to cast a long shadow uh, long after it had uh, ceased operating. Because, uh, as you mentioned, it was it was became Townley's Hospital, and he did actually go into Townley's on a number of occasions, and he hated going there because I think he felt that that was equivalent to going to the workhouse, going into Townley's. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure that's right. Yeah, although the it's if you read the <clears throat> the records in the 30s, I, I, I'm looking at them. In fact, the, the the workhouse ledger. I mean, it's look, it's it's a fantastic leather bound book that would be worthy of St Peter having. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and the way the pages are set out is there's people entering on the left hand page and people leaving on the right hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a bit like Piccadilly Circus, people going in and leaving. And one of the things that is absolutely clear is that families who had um, a destitute or difficult or ill uh, mother or father, a granny, they would 
put them in the workhouse for a couple of weeks for respite and bring them out again. And you see the evidence of this again and again and again. So although there was a real horror of the workhouse, quite rightly, um, it, was, it was a more, um, what shall I say? It was a bit like a sieve, you know, people kept on were going in and going out all the time. Yeah. Uh, could I just say something about, you mentioned the Foundling Hospital yeah. in, in London. Uh, there's now a museum there, which I visited a year or two back. But um, I'd come across that um, a few years earlier in that one of our neighbours across the road had this very elderly housekeeper used to come in and work for her who was I think in the end lived to over a hundred and it turned out she'd actually been left on the doorstep at the Foundling Hospital you know mm -hmm. as, a, as a baby and um, she then I think been sent out to some place that the Foundling Hospital ran out in Kent that was actually a hop farm and she had a marvellous time there she actually uh, wrote her life story, not, not never got published, but it was, it was uh, you know, amazing to hear the life that she had at the, at the hot farm. The, she had a marvellous time there and she had such a, a, a verve for, for life. I mean, she was driving a car well into her 90s and not just any car. It was a souped up hatchback that you expected <laughs> to see a boy race. As mm -hmm. And she, uh, you know, she carried on working for a, a this neighbour of ours, and I think until virtually just a few months before she died. And she, so I think, you know, it might have been just a minority of people who ended up in these places, but some of them did actually go on to have, you know, very happy lives, thank goodness. Okay, if, if we're all done, I'm sure we all want to join together in saying a massive thank you uh, to Dave. It's been wonderful having you with us again, Dave, and uh, yes. tapping into your almost encyclopedic knowledge of what's gone on in <laughs> Bolton over the, uh, over the years. And um, we look forward to welcoming you again at, at some point uh, before the world is much older. So thanks very much indeed from us all. Thank you. Thank you very much.